<laughs> Hello, am I live? Yes, it says you're live. Of course, why wouldn't I? It's one of those days. Hello, how is everyone? No one's here, it's just me at the moment, talking to myself, as per usual. Um, I'm going to be reading this week's, this week's, last Sunday's text, um, which was a review of Thai Shani's show called... It's quite long, I so I need to find it properly and read it. Your arms outstretched above your head, coding with the angels, is the name of the show. Um, but yes, work by Tai Shani at a gallery called Gathering, which this was the opening show. I think this is quite a new, yeah, quite a new gallery. Um, and this was the show they opened with. Um, it is in Soho as well. So like around the corner from me in the office and it's an odd space. It's an interesting space, but an odd space. Um, I think Ty's work fit quite nicely in it though. Um, but yeah, uh, do you know what actually, rather than me do some nattering before, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna really quickly read the text and then do the chit chat and then leave you to your day. So this will hopefully be quite a tight turnaround, quite a tight turnaround on the tech, on the reading, which these are normally, these are normally quite like long, like at least an hour of me having a chat, but um, we're gonna keep it tight. This is my last text of the year actually as well. So it'd be nice to be succinct. But yes, I think it'd be nice to, I've been looking forward to doing this live reading because I was ill over the weekend, last weekend, um, and so I had the flu. I was like KO and Gab had to put the text up for me and also do the audio and read it aloud for me, which was so fun <laughs> not being ill that wasn't fun but um listening to gab do the audio was fun because it was like i could tell that she was like on the on the brink of like bursting out laughing um and it, it was just like it was, it was funny it's like i i um no chit chat before i'm just gonna read the text that's what i said wasn't it no here we are um having an hour chatty cafe's logged on me um whatever um but yeah um it was it was funny listening to gab um because i do this thing sometimes that, that irritates her um i like do an impression of gab to her face um and she's like i don't sound like that and i'm like yes absolutely true i'm bad at doing the impression but that's not the benefit of the impression um but I felt like she was doing an impression of me the entire time. It sounded like it sounded so strange. Like obviously, like when she reads her text aloud, it sounds normal, like her, um, because it's, it's like these texts are written in her voice, and this text was written in my voice, and I was like, oh, my God, that sounds so strange. Um, but I think it's an interesting exercise because it. I don't. I don't when we were babies like when we were like 2015 new white pube I think our writing style sounded quite similar like we could write texts together we could write tweets and like even Gab's fiance would be like I don't know who's tweeting it's crazy now I think you probably can tell like it was our we've developed our own voices um writing styles and it becomes apparent in these moments maybe just to me I'm not sure if anyone else could like felt like that was a trip maybe tell me if I'm like this is only noticeable because I'm on the inside of it but yeah I felt like it was demonst demonstrative of um the difference in our writing styles which is a good thing I think um it's always nice to know that like we've got our own way of writing and wording things because variety is a spice of life, right? Anyway, so um, 
Uh, yeah, I was ill at the weekend, didn't get to read the text, which I felt really sad about, but fine because Gab read it and that was its own hoot. Um, but also I think I was I got ill on the Wednesday and I had already sent the first draft of this text to Gab. She'd sent it back with her notes um, and I hadn't had a chance to like tidy it. I did do some tidying while I was ill, but um there were a couple of loose ends that I was just too sick to kind of tie up properly so I've got a big chunky list of things to chat about because they're all the things like the unfulfilled wishes that I was unable to kind of resolve in the text because I was, I was just too sick like the brain fog I spent I was like asleep from Thursday afternoon all the way up to like Sunday evening Monday morning really um and I just needed that to, like, it was crazy. I don't know if any, any of you have been ill recently. Like, if you had, like, the flu or the cold that's going around, but it fucking knocks me out. Like, I was like, Jesus Christ, I haven't had the flu in ages. Actually, the last time I had the flu, was this the last time I had the flu? No, I, well, the last time I've been that sick, it was 2016, and I was invigilating I was at uni and I had a, like, a Sunday job like invigilating um, at this gallery space, um, this artist, artist led small gallery space. Um, and it was like so cold, like there was no heating and it was the middle of winter and it was so cold that I, I think I got actual, bro I got actual bronchitis from the, like just the pure cold. Um, and that was the last time I'd been that sick. Uh, which is crazy it's one of those things when you're ill I think no, do not, no we're not we're not I'm not doing this much chatting no one cares anyway okay I'm gonna get on I'm gonna read it's open I'm looking at it and I'm just like let me chat about literally anything else I'm not at the hairdressers anyway um okay I'm gonna read the text sorry um So this is the review from last Sunday, 20th of November, um, Taishani at Gathering. The emoji summary is one that Gabrielle, me Gabrielle made up, and I, but I would have probably done this emoji summary anyway, yeah. Um, the angel emoji, the bread emoji, and the skull. I am obsessed with the lives of saints. I cannot stop clicking along the link chain, swinging from Wikipedia page to Wikipedia page. I want to know everything about these ancient people and their primordial landscape. Jerome and Anthony and Elfric of Enisham. It started when I read the Deloriad and got swept up in the rush. The cartoon figure of St Thomas Aquinas as a daytime TV show, TV talk show host. Interloper haunted by those silent sheep, the cameras and lights. Yes, yes, I am obsessed with all of it. Loaded arcane symbolism, the medieval, the body horror of a gruesome death, meeting gruesome death with noble stoicism, the wandering saint penitent in the wilderness. I turn to the camera, my eyes full of sparkling mischief because everyone knows I am ready to say the line. Someone get Aquinas in here. The gallery looks like it used to be a car park. There are steps up at the door. The concrete floor is rough and cracked. Safe route in red stenciled caps, spray painted on the floor. The walls are baby pink and the lighting is green overhead. I feel like I am in an enormous mouth, about to begin my journey through to the gentle wet darkness of this morning testing to see Tayashani's exhibition at Gathering. A saint who lived by the Red Sea, St Anthony, the father of monks. He left the comfort of his riches to live a life of penitence and solitude. Wandering in the desert, he was tormented by demons and terrible visions sent by the devil. His most spectacular miracles were his healings. He specialized in healing ergotism, the convulsive symptoms of ergot poisoning, Ergot is a black fungus that grows on rye. 
infected grain heads look noticeably different with protruding black pegs of fungus jutting out at odd angles. When eaten, ergot causes fevers, hallucinations and distorted perception. They called it St Anthony's Fire. An epidemic of ergotism spread through Tsar Peter's the Tsar Peter the Great's army as they marched down the Terek step. Men who ate the poisoned bread either died from the nerve contractions or watched as their hands and feet fell off. And again, in 1951, in the town of Pont Saint Esprit in southern southern France, where victims saw flames, hellish creatures, infernos. Some wandered the streets screaming or flung themselves from windows in terror. It was traced back to the cursed bread of one bakery. There's a small island just off the coast of Sicily in the Aeolian archipelago. It's called Alicudi. There's only one restaurant. The main mode of local transport is donkey. It's so remote. It's a tough place to live. In the 1900s, harvests started failing. People in Alicudi started having visions. Women growing wings and flying to the mainland to steal food. Ghosts shitting in the bushes. Men turning into donkeys. A legend spread. These women were witches and at night they would stare in the mirror, cover their bodies in a special ointment and fly together in hordes across the sea. They would go to the mainland, to Palermo or Calabria, and return with bags full of food and treats and shopping. The island was starving, so of course, that's what witches would dream of doing with their powers. <coughs> Sorry, one sec. <coughs> Harvests were scarce and food was precious. They couldn't fr- afford to throw away the rotten grain heads, even though they had little black pegs of fungus jutting out of them bread and social unrest. There's something that I would like to read about. The history of bread as it relates to periods of social unrest. Apparently, the price of bread is the single is the best single indicator for predicting political instability. Hungry people are liable to dream of stealing or looting because hunger is a kind of political agent. I'm in the small intestine, in the gallery, thinking about how hungry people are liable to burn down buildings. <laughs> Historians say that by the time the French Revolution came around, rural unrest was already in the air. There was a grain shortage in the spring and French peasants were gripped by conspiracy theories. <coughs> Sorry. There was a grain shortage in the spring and French peasants were gripped by conspiracy theories about an aristocratic plot to purposefully withhold food in an attempt to starve them out. Scared and hungry, they armed themselves and stormed noble estates. They were searching for letters of feudal privilege, documents that granted the feudal lords their privileges over the peasantry. Once found, they burned the documents and left. That was all they really wanted. There were only three confirmed cases of a landlord being killed in the uprisings. Most feudal, most feudal aristocrats fled of their own accord. Historians have got a theory about the panic in the air, though. Something about how, when the harvest was poor and food was scarce, peasants couldn't afford to be so picky about the rye they milled or whether it was contaminated with... But there is something in the air. Something that traverses the electric space between us as we mill about on the streets in our cities. At sunset, when we crash about with nowhere to go or be seen because we are alive in this economy. Because Russia invaded Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe or post-pandemic bounce back or crash. Or because the government or all governments. Yes, yes. Something in the air. The saints turn. Jerome and Sebastian and Anthony ancient people, primordial landscape. They ask the undead, what makes them undead? And the undead, that's us, that's our cue. Turn back to them and reply. We speak as one in chorus. Necropolitics is the use of social and political power to dictate how some people may live and how some must die. Saints and bread, saints and bread, wait. 
I've forgotten the undead. Them too. Saints and bread and the undead, or the nearly dead, or the socially political, politically dead. Art making can be an attempt to close the gap. Art doesn't just have to be about things. You can make towards a theory or a history or a politic, aesthetic, object, palpable mood, in offering as gesture or an attempt to close the gap between interest and understanding. I think Taishani's work makes an aesthetic gesture. It moves towards things rather than being about things. Your arms outstretched above your head, closing with the angels at gathering. The pink walls in the entry are lined with A4 prints, little spacey ribbons, little spacey ribbons dance and twirl, disembodied across empty resonant spaces. The resonance is implied or projected. I'm telling you, take my word, something is echoing across these fields of open colour. Little windows fold architecture together and apart. Stairways and arches, cloister, colonnade, vault, crypt. The images are punctured by dense circles, opaque and heavy with their own pigment. Thick pink, baby blue, ochre and orange. But most importantly, black. Rock and spore. Lurid colour. Oh, hold on. Give me a sec, my laptop's just switching to night mode. <laughs> okay, we're back. Um, my body is drawn to the hot pink neon glow of the stairs. I tumble down them into a basement, a crypt. It would be a crypt in the same way our stomachs are crypts. Dark, the gentle wet pink of interior lining, coated in bile and webbed capillaries. Votive, offering. A giant candlestick towers above us. Cartoon drip melts in a steady stream down the length into a pool at its base. Static and solid. It's a prop. It's camp or kitsch. I can't tell the difference anymore. I can't decide. It's in the space and its giantness makes itself known. My body reacts. A relic in a glass orb. A tiny disembodied mint green hand holds two disembodied eyes on a stalk. Saint Lucia virgin martyr. She gouged out her own eyes or her eyes were gouged out on the orders of the emperor or a spurned suitor or well she carried Dante to the gates of purgatory as he slept. Then a centerpiece, a gold colonnade, green coins the size of a fist, a disembodied mint green hand, a pink glass orb, amber prism. This is a collection that has fallen out of the reliquary. 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 Yeah. Um, flat, black, <laughs> flat black circles hang, suspended in the air above. They are horrifyingly solid, thrown into stark matte relief against glowing turquoise glass and green vines. The reliquary is behind, in a glass case, a cast of bones, rib cage, femur, skeleton arm, with a mint green hand holding a gold laurel leaf containing plinth containing pink glass, pearl shard, pearl shard. I'm unable to speak. With a mint green hand holding a gold laurel leaf containing pink glass, pearl shard, bedazzled by little fried egg studs. A relic of a saint, a sacred body defiled by the gruesome horror of its death or made more holy by the quality of suffering. Because through sufferance, we understand the suffering of Christ, man of sorrows, the reliquary is punctured by flat black circles. It would be a crypt in the same way crypts are dark containers for a body unpound by horror, by sorrow, by suffering. The paintings are bigger down in the crypt, the same ribbons dancing across resonant space and folded architecture. They are the size of altar pieces and here the dense circles are all black. Voids, spore. The black circles puncture the paintings and leak across the space through the crypt. The saints are singing. They are singing about how necropolitical forces are banal, ubiquitous and embedded in our post-postmodern times. Because it is about the right to expose people to death 
or a lack of life, however you define a life or living. A theory of the walking dead in which specific bodies are forced to remain in suspended states, somewhere between life and actual real death. It is a theory, sure, but we see it moving everywhere in front of us. It is politics, society, the state or the social contract. It's the economy, stupid. It's a ghost that moves through the air between us, electric. It creates what Achille Mbembe called death worlds, new and unique forms of social existence in which vast populations are subjected to living in conditions that confer upon them the status of the living dead. The singing saints, full of sorrow. Their bodies are sacred, but they are not their own. And that is a kind of suspended state when you are no longer sovereign over your own body, when you are unbound, cut loose, at the whims of a force that's bigger than you, the state, the invisible hand of the free market, the will of God. Shani's show is not about dreams or magic. It's not even really religious or spiritual. I think it is a kind of hallucination in that it is entirely real and entirely internal. It moves towards the meeting point, body and horror and the politic that's built when those two things touch. It is about the way pain, sorrow, suffering opens up a doorway within ourselves. Pain, sorrow, suffering, abjection is acted. It is an agent or force that pushes through itself into a new space. It is the precursor to a specific kind of desire there are visual cultures that have understood that intimately, saved the sacred bodies that experienced such holy suffering. There are cultures that have understood the desire to open up a door within yourself and fly out across the sea in hordes to the mainland, burn letters of feudal privilege. There are cultures that have understood the tender thread that links bread and bodies and desire and death, how bread is a kind of body, a social body, or a sacred body, the body of Christ, but that's too far, that's overkill, isn't it? Maybe the crypt is one of many image worlds, a space where the relationship between darkness and images has to emerge, recalibrated and different. Maybe undeath or nearly death or social political death is a suspended state in the same way that hallucinating from contaminated bread is a suspended state and both of these states are active political agents that open a doorway into a new space where the saints are singing about the banality of necropolitics in our post postmodern times. We are on the brink of civil unrest because Russia invaded Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe, post pandemic bounce back, crash, the government, all governments, government on high, on the streets, in our cities, at sunset. Desire is such a powerful force, it is real. It is a body of its own. It joins the crowd as it heaves towards fantasy or forever. I would like to believe them. Anthony, Lucia, Jerome, Catherine, Sebastian. Their song is a whisper now, barely audible. I think they said that maybe we are meant to perish. Maybe through death, we exit into new space, a new image world. I think they said something, how there's something in the air, electric between us. And that's the text. Um, now I've read it again, I'm happy with it. It's so funny how that works, isn't it? Um, I think it's fine the way it is. I think when I left it um, to give back to Gab so that she could put it up for me, I was like, oh. I wish I'd been able to write about this. I wish I'd been able to write about that. I wish I'd been able to fix that loose end. But do you know what? It's kind of... That's all right. That's that's not bad. I'm going to cut myself some slack. Um, it's fine. I like, it's, not, it's not just fine. That's a good, that's a good review. Um, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Um, I love that. Why not? <laughs> Let me just, ooh, where's he gone? Come back. Okay, let's open my new book. 
Mm, now I'm reading some of the notes I didn't manage to resolve. I don't know if this is actually interesting to anyone other than myself, but I think it's important that I do kind of, I don't know, air out my thoughts in this way. I think I might be the only person that's interested in reading out the contents of my notebook that I didn't manage to resolve into the text. But even if it's just for me and like the catharsis of like letting go of these thoughts, regardless of like resolution or whatever, conditioning them for public view, I think that's enough. Like, even if no one else cares, I do. Um, in case so. So. Right, I think the main thought I had um, that I wanted to kind of air was um, something that only really became apparent in the film and it's something that I didn't mention within the text because the film is really long, there are several acts and there is so much packed in. Like it's not like a long run time but there's just like a lot of scenes within the film and like it covers a lot of ground, very text heavy, beautiful film. But just like this text would have been, this review would have been 50,000 words if I'd spoken about the film as well because I had so much to say. And, but maybe that's the piece that I feel is missing. Um, but this is something that like popped up within the space of the, within the space of the film, something that the film prompts more than like the downstairs or like the the wall base works, um, the installation or the wall base works. Um, it becomes more apparent with the film, so maybe that's missing. But I think not just the crypt tie plays with like you know, I I think within the text it's quite obvious that like the crypt is a kind of image world like that has a relationship to darkness or death and images or like those three spaces are like tied into one image world right within the crypt um and i think that's one of them the film makes apparent that there are like three different kinds of image world Im image worlds that like ty wants to play with like there's the crypt there's the cell and there's the cave um and they will have different relationships to darkness and images and different ways of holding on to like the specialness or like the way that images are revered, um, a different way of like holding on to images as special and re to be revered, right? Like a different way of rever revering images, um, or like um, maybe images in the, in those image worlds become like a presence that haunts haunts them I don't know but I think it's something that like that's a loose end I never really managed to resolve or tie up it's just kind of left open and maybe this is like a deeply philosophical so anyway but like hmm, is this a philosophical point I don't know I can't decide is it? Yeah, no, I think it is actually. Maybe this is more about aesthetic theory, like the idea of like different relationships to images are, are kind of occurring, like negotiating different relationships to images and darkness within these different spaces um, that contain like a, a slightly different poli political, palpable political atmosphere or like a palpable um, social atmosphere, or just the dynamic between yourself, the image, the darkness, where those things are like calibrated ever so, ever so slightly differently. That's something that I, yeah, I think I left open and not really tied up, but it is interesting. Um, and it's, I think with this show, it kind of felt like um, something that was happening very deliberately and in front of me and like visibly right the, like the, the, the sleight of hand often like your relationship to the image or the object the art object the image right within the artwork like those things can kind of be a bit chronic as the background it's something that you only really think about um through other things or um as a baseline through to other things um often 
but actually Ty is questioning the very fundamental like the very fundamental terms of like engagement and display um with the props like the big camp candle um like the the oversizedness of that and like there's this sunset lamp shining on the flame so it looks like the flame is casting this little colorful halo um like that could that could be camp or kitsch but it could also be like th this tension right but so, like the terms the tension um pulling the terms of like display and exchange taught um i think it's really interesting um and i love it when artists do that i i, I should say i really liked this show i think it's obvious within the text but i really like this show i think it felt affective, um, accomplished but in like a in a, in a not in a slick way, accomplished in the sense that like everything was very balanced and the like effective hit felt like it like kind of kicked me in the gut a bit like I really was like ooh um, like skillful in that way. Um, Another thing I read um, an interview. An interview? Yes, I read an interview where Ty was talking about the psychedelic as a space that can drive new visions of society, an imaginative space where new futures can emerge. And I think that's something that's kind of maybe missing a bit from the text because I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, it didn't really fit into that dynamic too well of like. Um, social or the political like the unrest and um um the slight like slip away from reality but like is present in in that close touch proximity with death um like the the, the um the, the, the liminality the li liminality the liminal space of like um Ne the, the necropolitical the necropolitical is a liminal space and like social unrest and like the religious imagery um all of these things i think the one thing that is in the show but missing from the text a bit is uh, yeah the hallucinatory or the psychedelic and um it's something that, yeah, is very powerful, very present within the show. I didn't really write about it too well because I never really got to that loose end in time to tie it up or like even make it present as a loose end. Um, but yeah, I think there was this nice, neat balance, right, between social unrest um death or like the undead like body horror the undead social unrest and like the psychedelic and um this interview that ty did was about the neon hieroglyph which is the film the name of the film in the show um where she says the neon hieroglyph was trying to create a communist affect by talking about psychedelic experiences or certain kind of senses that happen during them and I never quite managed to figure out how to slot in or like work through towards what that communist affect means or what that does or like how, how that feels within the show it's never really it's, it's just something that I kind of like had it in mind while I was writing and I feel like maybe 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 the bits about social unrest kind of touch on like that vague um idea of communist affect but I never really addressed it as an idea that, like, that the artist has about the work or like you know the, the artist trying to create a communist affect like if that's the end goal of the film or like if that's like the aim of the film um but maybe that's because I didn't write about the film ever um I don't know basically um it is just something that like informed some of the thinking around social unrest and then I think the thinking about necropol necropolitics um, maybe was also slightly unresolved because there was something I, I wanted to say about death as an 
infinite state, infinite state as a non finite state. Um, infinite, unfinite rather than infinite. <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, you know what I mean? No. Um, death as not necessarily an end point or like. Um, yeah. Oh, oh no. Death as this non finite state. Um, and there was, it, it was another one of the points that I didn't manage to join up. Um, but apparently, I was going to read the bit from my notebook. Apparently, that's a, co that's a common trope across the mythologies of different cultures and civilizations the journey to the land of the dead, the return. It's a staple part of the hero's journey, the ability to enter the realm of the dead while still alive and to return with something, an, ob an object, a beloved secret knowledge. It's proof of the hero's exceptional status as more than a mortal, but it also kind of, I don't know, it bends, it bends our understanding of what death actually is, right? Like the one true universal inevitability, if it can be defied though, like surely like, then maybe it's not like a, an, an a universal inevitability maybe it's something that like maybe it's just an ontological state in the same way that like any other ontological state is an ontological state um but those two things are quite linked across antiquity right the journey to the underworld and the hallucination of a religious trip um like those two things are quite close through antiquity like or mythology and cultural history right um and i wasn't sure if that was a way to kind of figure out or resolve that question i had about communist affect the ancient world didn't have capitalism really or at least our understanding of work and death that capitalism re requires maybe there's something like uh, maybe the necropolitical is embedded within capitalism's machinery or like capitalism's death drive um, and maybe it is in this antiquity that we return um, to conjure an aesthetic to move towards a communist affect maybe that's what that is I don't know that's unresolved um, if anyone has any thoughts about that communist affect please let me know because I would love to have a chat about it because I I'm just really taken by it as a phrase as like a thing that you can aim for what is communist effect affect affect effect communist affect what is communist affect um what does it feel like how do you know when it hits you um what does it mean for a work to have communist affect I don't know. Um, I think this work did have communist affect now that we mention it when we really think about it, because I think it kind of, this show at least kind of made me think that there was something like uh, unstable or destabilizing in the atmosphere. Um, and like those bits about like, oh, in our cities, on our streets, that's unsent, blah, 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 those bits are kind of speaking to that. But like, I think sometimes when I don't really have the answers, I just kind of try and write a really beautiful sentence to try and distract people and like bamboozle them and be like, well, I don't know why, like, you know, as an art critic, I don't have all the answers, babe. Like, it's just a vibe sometimes. Like sometimes it is just affect. Um, and maybe I'm looking for an answer, like a hard and fast answer from something that's just vibes, yeah. But um, when I don't know, um, when I don't know how to put those vibes <laughs> in critical terms, and like um, theoretical terms, or like explain it in like a human way, I just go, here's a really, here's what I think are like beautiful poetic sentences, prose. And I, I just kind of like try and bamboozle people. Um, and it makes me laugh because I think maybe sometimes I write my best texts about things that I don't understand, um, which is funny. What can you do but laugh? Um, but I think I think that's part of why I liked the show because it kind of worked on this scale that felt like um, 
it, it worked on this scale where it was like, I don't understand this as like um, a thing that's happening. It's just like, it's aesthetic, right? It, 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 it's art, it, it, art exists outside the realm of like verbal language, not in a language of its own, but beyond like operating under completely different laws, right? Like it's not language, it's just the end the end of language right and so when we try and put it into words fucks up that's actually something that has stuck with me from like art school our head of course used to always say that like art begins where language ends and I think like that's like the most solid bit of teaching I got um it's the thing that sticks with me um that I really believe as well um and I've really like taken on as a belief of my own now because it makes sense I think it's true um, and maybe that's why I, I, I often find myself writing about shows that I liked, but I have no way of like understanding and like the, the, um, the slippage of like trying to put into words how I liked it, why I liked it. Maybe that's the thrill, right? Of like writing reviews and like, that's the sick thrill. That's a sick kick I get. Sick, twisted pleasure um why you know seven years on I'm still bothering to write about exhibitions because it's taking this thing that's like completely non-verbal that's just vibes right body feelings like that and I'm putting it in words which is like an unhelpful measure right it's like trying to convert inches into centimeters it's never going to be completely round um it's never going to be a completely round number it's always going to be something slightly odd or like an odd fit um or like trying to convert like grams into millimeters, right? Like maybe it's that, like this is just like not a measurement system or like not a categorization system that's matching up against the thing, but like you can try. Um, so I think that's, do you know what? I think that's a sign of a really good show that that's the work, that's the level and that's the point where I'm leaving this. That's what like the fundamental question I have is that like it the, the, the words aren't enough it's not the words it's not it's not about words I think that's how I know I really enjoyed it because it's making me think about that yeah rather than rather than nitty gritty um I will leave you with the uh, with this note about uh, communist affect um because I think this is the closest I got to understanding it um I'll just read the note uh communist affect question mark but bread and tripping like psychedelic hallucination trip like that kind of tripping are connected and so are bread and social unrest so maybe it's a sideways move maybe bread is the link in the middle between tripping and social unrest or revolution and i don't know what acid communism is because i haven't read any mark fisher but actually is that acid communism i don't know um, but maybe, yeah, maybe it's those two things, like social unrest, tripping, and like maybe that maybe bread and um, like the real materiality that bread represents, right? The bodily material, like the, 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 the bodily reality, like the material, the material fact that bread represents there. Maybe that's like in the middle, connecting those two things. Um, maybe. Who knows? Um, not me, basically, as we know, um, because language fucks up, slips against good art making or effective art making. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, those are the loose ends. That was the text. Is there anything left? No. I will, well, lads, I'll see you in the new year. Um, I will do. I've, uh, no, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, tomorrow I will do a little blog post, um, a little roundup of all my texts this year that I've written, like a list of like ZM 2022. And then I think I'll do another roundup of like both mine and Gabrielle's texts, like an annual roundup of like, this was 2022. Because sometimes the texts end up in different parts of the website, like in the miscellaneous section or, or, um, you know, 
the miscellaneous section or like the art thoughts section. Actually, I don't know if I've written any. Have I written any art thoughts this year? I don't think I have. I've had a pretty straightforward year. Um, I will say, as an ending note, my two favourite texts and my two favourite shows that I saw this year were the first and last. It was my one of my favourite shows I saw this year was the Labena show at Tate and this show, Ty at Gathering. Um, two of my favourite artists. Um, and my favourite texts that I've written about them. Um, which is a nice way to begin and end the year. That's nice. Sure is satisfying. But um, maybe when I do the little roundup, I'll give you some thoughts on whether I went to feel about all the texts. Because I don't know, maybe, maybe it's nice to look back and have a think about what you've done over the course of the year. I know a year is like an arbitrary like, unit of measurement for time, but how else are you meant to mark it as it slips past, you know, on the slow march towards death? How else are you meant to mark it? Um, do Is now the time for New Year's resolutions? I don't think so. Maybe I'll come back in the first text reading of next year, 2023, and I'll tell you my New Year's resolutions because I don't know I've got them yet. I've still got a month to figure out what I want to do next year. But um, maybe my New Year's resolution will be work hard. Yeah, keep your head down, work hard. Um, that sounds fitting. Um, but yeah, all right, I'll see you in the new year. Um, this is quite sad now, isn't it? Yeah, see you in the new year. Have a nice Christmas. Um, make sure you have a rest, even if it's for a little bit. Make sure you take some time for yourself and enjoy the festive period and eat a mince pie and open a present and spend some time with people you love hope you have a lovely time i'll catch you on the other side um gabrielle and i are taking we're not taking our traditional december month off like of pure holiday no thoughts head empty just vibes experiencing nothing but pure free time we are actually going on a writing residency for 16 days so that we can knuckle down and get a head start on our New Year's resolution, which is head down, work hard, um, apparently. Um, so we'll be writing, but not online. We're still going to be offline. Um, so that'll be fun. Will it? Yes, no, it will be fun. I like spending time with my friend. It'll be nice. Um, it will be hard work, though. But I'll catch you on the other side. All right. I don't want to leave now because this is the last one of the year. Otherwise, it's bye till 2023, which sounds like a long time away, but it's not. All right. Okay. Actually leaving now. Bye.